You look at the order. There's a line down the middle there where the leaders walk, and that's at Nuremberg. And then it's just surrounded by these masses and masses and masses of people in lines and all these orderly displays of power. And then there's Hitler there like this. And one of the things Hitler was really proud of was the fact that he could stand like that for like eight hours. And that was willpower. This video comes from a 2014 lecture at the University of Toronto entitled Personality Lecture 20, Conscientiousness, Biology, and Traits. The class concludes with a 17-minute lesson on the wonders of Adolf Hitler, the orderly and awe-inspiring rallies he held at Nuremberg, select quotes about the disease-ridden Jews, and a Nazi propaganda film that somehow managed to heighten Jordan Peterson's euphoria. You see, when it comes to handsome and homicidal men, especially ones in uniforms and jackboots, Peterson has a tendency to get all excited. This lecture was given two years before Peterson began acting as a father figure or cult leader to hundreds of thousands of men. He now boasts 4.75 million YouTube subscribers, who he says need to become orderly and organized. Peterson likes to brag about transforming the lives of young men all over the world, depicting himself as some kind of savior. The narrative in this lesson will not be told from the perspective of the victims, but the victimizers, on whom Peterson heaps praise. The voices of the victims, for example the Jews, will be omitted. So, now let's look at this from a sociocultural perspective. So, I've spent a lot of time studying Hitler because I'm interested in ideological possession. You know, and Hitler is a great example of that because well, because his ideology was so harsh, but it was also so attractive to people. It was so unbelievably attractive. You know, and you've got to ask how the hell you account for something like that. So, um, I'm, I'm going to dim the lights a little bit here, because you guys have to be able to see this. When he says he's spent a lot of time studying Hitler because he's interested in ideological possession, he means satanic possession. He has likened Hitler to Lucifer, referred to him twice as the devil, said that he was satanically possessed, and claimed he turned ordinary Germans into Nazis by utilizing black magic. Indeed, satanic possession is one of Peterson's favorite subjects. He writes about it in his books, Maps of Meaning and Beyond Order, and he spoke about it repeatedly at the University of Toronto, including in lectures in which he focused on authoritarianism. He has recommended a book that is about genocide and satanic possession, called Shake Hands with the Devil, The Failure of Humanity in Rwanda, and his favorite novel is Crime and Punishment, about a paranoiac who confides to his sister that he bludgeoned two women to death with an axe because he was instructed to by the devil. When Peterson says Hitler's ideology was so attractive, so unbelievably attractive, this has multiple meanings, one being that he finds Hitler's ideology so attractive. Be aware that Peterson has said that young men find his public speeches attractive. Peterson habitually characterizes Hitler and himself using language that ranges between highly similar and identical. For instance, he has said that Hitler was smart, artistic, orderly, very strange, sensitive to disgust, a good orator, spoke in a way that was spontaneous, and climbed to the top of the dominance hierarchy. And he has made the same statements about himself. All right, so you look on the right there, eh? That's the Nuremberg Parade Ground. So I hope you can see this a little bit. The left, there, that's all people, right? So the Nazis built this parade ground in Nuremberg that was like the biggest parade ground ever built on the planet. And they'd have hundreds of thousands of people at these rallies, right? And so you look at the order. There's a line down the middle there where the leaders walk, and that's at Nuremberg. And then it's just surrounded by these masses and masses and masses of people in lines and all these orderly displays of power. And then there's Hitler there like this. And one of the things Hitler was really proud of was the fact that he could stand like that for like eight hours. And that was willpower, as far as he was concerned. And he was a worshiper of willpower. And he bathed four times a day. So he's also somebody who was very much obsessed with cleanliness. Cleanliness and willpower and order. So that's Hitler. That's Hitler. Cleanliness, willpower, and order. What's not to like? And what's not to like about Peterson, who counsels millions of men to be clean, driven, and get their lives in order? As for the professor snapping to attention and giving the Zig Heil, which for educational purposes he had to model, because none of his students would have known what it looked like, he extended his arm in tribute for 15 seconds. Imagine you're on the subway during your morning commute, and a man stands up and starts raving about Hitler, saying things like, cleanliness and willpower and order, so that's Hitler and gives the Nazi salute. What would you think? That he was mad? 
This Peterson lecture has over 91,000 views, 2,000 likes, and the comments section is brimful with adoration and praise. Anyway, back to the gushing. Now look at that. That's something. That's Nuremberg again. So this is called the Cathedral of Lights. And so the, that's the parade ground there at the bottom that I just showed you that was full of people. So you get some idea of how big that is. Now all those lights around that, which they called the Cathedral of Lights, was the Luftwaffe gave the Nazis all their anti-aircraft lights. And then they arrayed them around the parade ground so the whole thing was enclosed by this perfectly orderly Cathedral of Lights. And that was part of the spectacle that went along with the Nazi with the Nazi, Nazi party rallies at Nuremberg. Peterson never informs his students that the Nazis murdered two-thirds of Europe's Jews, including 1.5 million children, nor does he ever detail how this happened, for example by using a timeline of events or primary and secondary historical sources. Instead, he wows at the Luftwaffe searchlights beaming into the sky at a Nuremberg rally. Here's a picture of one of those searchlights. Isn't it attractive? One of the reasons why Peterson likes the Cathedral of Light is because the Nazis corrupted or inverted Christian symbolism and terminology, like the crucifix or the notion of a cathedral. Corrupting and inverting Christianity is also what happens in the occult, and the nighttime Nuremberg rallies were like giant occultic ceremonies. Nazism was a state-backed death cult, and if you read Hitler's books and speeches, you might find it striking that he often spoke like an occultist or necromancer, making reference to demons, devils, spiders, serpents, beasts, death and decay, as well as mystical forces and ghosts rising from the graves of fallen soldiers to take revenge for Germany. More on Nazism and the occult later. And then, so, you know, you look at the top left one there, those are, those are soldiers, those are, I can't remember, at the Nuremberg rallies they had all sorts of people there. They had like the shovel brigade and they were all standing there with their shovels ready to, you know, shovel for Germany. When he did the Zig Heil, he was imitating a Nazi. When he simulated a member of the shovel brigade preparing to shovel for Germany, he was imitating a Nazi. You could do this and not be a Nazi, but Peterson does it because he's a Nazi. Also, think about how, in retrospect, the shovel brigade could be seen as foreshadowing. The Germans were going to bury the Jews. I think this is why Peterson chose to highlight the Shovel Brigade. Later, while showing a propaganda film, he will point out a monolith topped by a shovel. And athletes and all sorts of people arrayed so that, you know, there, there's this massive display of order and power. So you look at the top left-hand corner, you see how those people are lined up. It's absolutely perfect. And then you see the same thing on the right here. Eh? So look, I mean, look at the organization of that. Everything's square and perfect and everybody's in line and you know they're all in uniforms and they're all going like this the same way and then when they when they march the soldiers they're in perfect lines in perfect squares and they're all going like this you know it's it's absolutely rigid orderly perfection. If you were to suggest to Peterson's adherents that their guru was praising Nazism they would deny it and probably call you an extremist. I mean he's not praising the Nazis he's just saying again and again, that they represented perfection while imitating a Wehrmacht soldier or Hitler giving the Zig Heil and mimicking the goose step in his cowboy boots. Incredibly, if you were to suggest to Peterson's critics that he was praising Nazism, they too would likely deny it and probably call you an extremist. Because at a time when fascism and neo-Nazism are braiding below the surface of civilized society, People who call themselves liberals will loftily inform you that not only is Peterson not a Nazi, but there are no Nazis. Trivialities out of the way, they can return to combating real social problems, for example by accusing white people with dreadlocks of cultural appropriation. And so the Germans, well, Germans tend to be conscientious, you know, which is part of the reason why they have excellent engineers and part of the reason why their economy is so damn powerful. But one of the downsides of conscientiousness is orderliness. Right? And so, well, you know, people think the Nazis were uncivilized, but the new evidence seems to suggest that they weren't uncivilized at all. They were really, really, really civilized. Oh yes, the new evidence that suggests the Nazis were really, really, really civilized. The new evidence that Peterson never cites, like he never provides sources for so many of his bogus claims. He's an academic fraud and a compulsive, irredeemable liar. But then charlatanism and falsification are part of the Nazi ethos. And then if you get too civilized, too orderly, too conscientious, 
then things go to hell in a handbasket very, very rapidly. So, now, this, some of this stuff is awful, but I'm going to read it to you anyways, because you need to know how this sort of things work. He's going to read to you. You're not going to read it yourself. He'll supply the meaning. With regards to educational literature, he's subscribing to what's known as the positivist paradigm or the banking model of education. Put plainly, he tells you the so-called facts, and you internalize those facts. You don't critically evaluate the information, in this case quotes, or discuss them with your classmates, or provide feedback to the class, because that would be democratic, and Peterson is a fascist. Sadly, in Canada, this type of authoritarian education persists, and is considered by many to be normal. Hitler emerged into power in the 1930s when, when Germany was in a real state of chaos, right? Because it was after the Second World War or the First World War. Ah, Hitler didn't seize power. He emerged into power. Note the bias in his speech. Also, Germany was in a real state of chaos. But luckily, as Peterson will later say, along came Hitler, who brought order. Order versus chaos is one of Peterson's favorite themes. Interestingly, it was also one of Hitler's favorite themes. Hitler spoke about the need to establish order, by which he meant an aggressive form of fascism undergirded by white supremacy and a dollop of occultism, and eliminate chaos, by which he meant Jewry, Bolshevism, parliamentary democracy, and multiculturalism. Once more, Peterson is forever telling his Marx that they need to get their lives in order, and that they require an antidote to chaos. Again, chaos was one of the epithets Hitler assigned to the Jews, and he wrote that Germany needed an antidote for the Jewish poison. Of course, it was the Jews who would be poisoned with Zyklon B, the pesticide that Peterson can't stop talking about. I mean, what undergraduate psychology student doesn't learn about Zyklon B? Think of how that could benefit them if they went on to become social workers or forensic psychologists. In the early 1920s, Hitler twice alluded to gassing the Jews, but it seems nobody paid attention. When I tell people that Jordan Peterson is a Nazi, people tend not to pay attention. Remember, there are no Nazis. This is the refrain of the far right that's echoed by the center left. For Hitler, you were either part of the order or chaos. If you were a democratically minded citizen, he linked you to communism and, by extension, the Jews. Peterson does something similar when he brands liberals communists and Marxists. If you're a member of Peterson's Hitlerite cult, you're part of the order. But if you're a critic, you're the chaos. In the next clip, you'll hear Peterson talking about the Spanish flu because he believes that epidemics cause governments and citizens to become more authoritarian. To some extent, he may be right. After all, COVID-19 sparked a huge surge in hate crime. People who are non compus mentis, that is, not mentally sound, may confuse pathogens with people, and may want to combat those people. During the 2022 occupation of Ottawa, seditionists, conspiracy theorists, and fascists posing as democratic citizens concerned about COVID-19 restrictions held signs reading, Media is the virus. I reckon that Peterson thinks that Hitler's comparing the Jews to pathogens and parasites sprang out of his mental illness which likely heightened the fear of germs that many people would have had during the Spanish flu. I know that Peterson has read a psychological assessment of Hitler written by US intelligence during the war because he has admitted as much in class, saying that Carl Jung contributed to the report. This is true, and Jung was well suited for the role because he was Swiss German and one of the keenest observers of Hitler and the psychological dimensions of his rise and Germany's descent into madness. Jung was also intimately familiar with schizophrenia, as Peterson would know, and the report he helped create argued that Hitler had borderline schizophrenia. I believe that if the Americans and Carl Jung had known what we know now about Hitler, they would have dropped the borderline. You have to remember what happened at the end of the First World War. The Spanish flu. The Spanish flu epidemic, which was generated in the trenches, because you can generate really intense, intensely deadly... Um, illnesses, if the illness can be transmitted from one person to another very quickly, right, because the, it's okay for the organism to kill you as long as you last long enough to get the illness to the next person. And so if you're all crammed together in filthy conditions, the illness can just hop from person to person, and so it can breed particularly deadly forms. That's what happened with Spanish flu, and then the Spanish flu went all around the world, and it killed more people than World War I did. Okay, so that was World War I, then there was the Spanish flu, 
Then the German economy fell completely apart, and there was hyperinflation, and so there was complete chaos, and then the Germans were worried that the communists were going to take over, and it was like, it was like a little bit of hell on earth. World War I, the Spanish flu, and the interwar years weren't hell on earth for, say, the Belgians or French, whose countries the Germans invaded, but for the Germans, who were made to pay war reparations after starting and losing a war that lasted four years and took the lives of 40 million people. A war the German public would not even admit they lost until six months after the debacle was over. Now let's return to Peterson talking about the hero of this story, the savior, the redeemer, the chosen one who turned hell on earth into a kind of heaven marked by cleanliness, willpower, and order. And so along came Hitler. Now Hitler was one of these orderly types. And so here's the kind of language he used. This is from a pamphlet from 1936. The Jew is world parasite. The people of the world will recognize the Jew as world parasite, and there will be a time when there will be one united front of all people against the Jewish world parasite. And the pamphlet ends, and humanity will be freed from the most severe illness from which it suffered for thousands of years. Now you can think about this as metaphor, and of course it is metaphor, but it's weird because it's not precisely conscious metaphor. What seems to be happening is because Hitler is one of these people who's hypersensitive to disgust and extremely orderly, it's, it's natural for his mind to conceive of categories in this way. Since Hitler was orderly, it was only natural for him to conceive of the Jews as parasites. What could be more natural? And these days, who likens liberals to parasites? Jordan Peterson. For example, in lectures such as Campus Indoctrination, the Parasitization of Myth. You see, according to the Canadian professor, other professors don't facilitate education. Instead, they indoctrinate their charges with communism and act like parasites who infiltrate and undermine the unsullied realm of mythology, by which he means superstition, that he promotes so as to enlist the uncritical into his cult. Superstitious beliefs pair well with fascism. Hitler was always talking about the Aryan people as like pure and perfect, but also as a body, you know? So the Aryan race was a body. And the problem that the Aryan race faced was that there was all these parasites that were attacking it. And it was the moral obligation of the Germans to push back against those parasitical forces. As for the pure Aryan body under attack from parasites, I believe that Hitler confused the Jews with parasites because he experienced schizophrenic delusions wherein parasites were infiltrating his mind. Hitler said of the Jews, These people have always been parasites. Lately I have the feeling sometimes that they are a kind of cerebral parasite. They know only too well what is happening in my brain, for instance. A common schizophrenic delusion is thought broadcasting, in which schizophrenics believe others can hear their thoughts or read their minds. In Peterson's first book, Maps of Meaning, he writes about thought broadcasting and other schizophrenic delusions. In fact, across his three books, he mentions schizophrenia and schizophrenics 33 times. He mentions the Holocaust just 10 times, yet he claims that all of his books are predicated on the Holocaust. Also in Maps of Meaning, Peterson documents how in his early 20s, he was consumed by schizophrenia. He writes about a psychic split that completely transformed his personality and caused him to embark on some kind of mystical quest. He dreamed about nuclear Armageddon two or three nights a week, for years. He heard an admonishing voice that scolded him nearly every time he made an utterance. After saying this, he cites a journal article on schizophrenia called Hearing Voices. He thought about the murderous preparation of the Cold War day in and day out, from the instant he woke up to the moment before he fell asleep. He says he was in the grip of what he calls a driving force, and he admits that he habitually had a barely controllable urge to stab his university classmates in the neck with his pen. He also includes a letter that he wrote to his father, wherein he suggests three times that he's on the brink of insanity. He once told an interviewer that he was worried about going insane, and he's been lecturing about schizophrenia for decades in ways that are atypical and obviously self-referential. What I'm saying is this. One of the reasons why Peterson identifies with Hitler is because Hitler was almost certainly schizophrenic. And so is Peterson. Now, let's listen again to what Peterson says about the moral obligation of the German people. The problem that the Aryan race faced was that there was all these parasites that were attacking it, and it was the moral obligation of the Germans to push back against those parasitical forces. The Germans had to push back against those parasitical forces. Jews, 
communists, Democrats, and Peterson counsels his followers to push back against democratic governments, falsely claiming that they're oppressive. Here are three instances of him using the phrasal verb push back. 1. It was the moral obligation of the Germans to push back against those parasitical forces. 2. So we're going to pay for it, and hopefully we'll wake up and push back before we pay too high a price. This is Peterson criticizing the Canadian government for drawing up hate speech laws to prosecute Ernst Sundel, Canada's most notorious neo-Nazi organizer. Never mind that the Canadian government actually tested out hate speech laws on James Keegstra, a neo-Nazi educator from Alberta, Peterson's home province. Peterson suggested to his audience that, like the government went after Zundel, who once visited Auschwitz to prove the Holocaust never happened, officials would go after them. However, they could elude detainment if they were willing to wake up and push back. Wake up is a neo-Nazi dog whistle that comes from the slogan, Germany awake. Germans were supposed to be awake to the Jewish poison. During the same talk in which Peterson defended Zundel, he shrugged off allegations that he was like Hitler and relayed what he called a joke about Jews being gassed. So that's two examples of Peterson summoning pushback when speaking about Nazism. And in one, he's defending Nazism and slamming the Canadian government for opposing Nazism. Here's the third instance of him employing pushback. When should you push back against the oppression, despite the danger? When you start nursing secret fantasies of revenge, when your life is being poisoned and your imagination fills with the wish to destroy. This is a message to Peterson's followers to take revenge against oppression, by which he means governmental or societal oppression. His target audience includes paranoiacs and people with antisocial personality disorder who believe the rule of law is impeding them from exploring their inner savage. During the 2022 occupation of Ottawa, Peterson tried to channel those fantasies of revenge by counseling his adherents to break the law and participate in that siege. He encouraged criminal behavior in several ways, for example by informing participants that when and if they chose to stop protesting was up to them. Never mind that the protests were declared illegal and a state of emergency had been declared by the city of Ottawa, the province of Ontario, and the government of Canada. While vilifying the government of Canada, Peterson denied that any of the seditionists were white supremacists or neo-Nazis, even going so far as to declare that Canada was devoid of Nazis. He suggested that health measures violated people's rights and was a form of harassment. Remember his theory, epidemics lead to an increase in authoritarianism. When Peterson wrote that you should push back against your oppressors when your life is being poisoned, he meant poisoned by the Jews. Jordan Peterson is a crypto-fascist. He has called the Canadian government communists and Marxists, by which he meant Jews. It's another strategy taken from Hitler's playbook. Hitler claimed that officials in the Weimar Republic were communists and Jews. So, so here's what happened in Germany. So Hitler, when he came to power, some of the things that happened in Germany, he first started a public health campaign. And so he had these vans that had doctors in them, x-ray machines and so on, and they went all over Germany screening people for tuberculosis, which, you know, was an infectious disease and also a particularly terrible one. They actually knocked down the rates of tuberculosis in Germany quite a lot. No, the Nazis didn't knock down the rates of TB because there was no TB program. Peterson is lying in order to depict Hitler as a defender of public health. So it was like, well, let's, let's embark on a public health and cleanliness campaign. It's like, well, okay, you get rid of tuberculosis that way. So then, then the next thing that he did, or one of the next things that he did was, he was kind of irritated about how messy and ugly the German factories were. So, you know, because they're kind of dirty and they've got rats in them and mice and bugs and so on. So Like there was no TB campaign, there was no clean up the factories campaign. Peterson will go on to say that the Nazis cleaned up the factories using Zyklon B, but of course, this too is false. Peterson has lots of practice lying about Hitler. He says Hitler was democratically elected, that he won in a landslide the likes of which we seldom see, that he fought in World War I in the trenches, that he was nearly killed in the trenches by a shell that did in all of his friends, and that he was denied entrance to art school four times. Peterson fabricates such stories to make Hitler look heroic, hygienic, interested in public order, a bulwark against communism, and someone who we ought to pity. Of course, Hitler was really a narcissist, liar, and homicide-minded psychopath determined to create an us and a them so that he could unleash as much chaos as possible, as is Peterson. Again, he just played an active role 
in an attempt to overthrow a democratically elected government. In the next clip, observe how Peterson smiles and tries to stifle a laugh when lying to young and impressionable students about fictitious cleaners being tasked with making Nazi factories pristine. The next thing that they decided to do was to clean up the factories. So they had people, you know, sweeping them all up and, and fixing the grounds in front and planting flowers and that kind of thing. And they were fumigating them to get rid of the parasites. And the fumigation agent they used was an insecticide called Zyklon B. And Zyklon B was the gas that was eventually used in the concentration camps. And so, so you can see the connection there, right? It's, it's like a logical progression of ideas. It's a logical progression of ideas. So to Peterson, we can glean that what's logical is Hitler going from cleaning up TB, which never happened, to cleaning up Nazified factories, which never happened, to cleaning up the Jews, which did happen, but Peterson prefers terms like clean up over words like murder. This is intriguing because Hitler spoke of, quote, a vast plan of extermination, an internal and total cleanup. Again, if you were to ask Peterson's followers why he suggested that murdering Jews was logical, they would deny their hero said any such thing, or would accuse you of taking him out of context. In the cult, there's only one repository of truth, Peterson. Any interlopers armed with pesky questions must be castigated as dishonest. However, Peterson has insinuated that slaughtering the Jews was logical on multiple occasions. For example, during another U of T lecture, in which he said, So here's what you should have done if you were a Nazi and you wanted to win the war. You should have enslaved the Jews and the gypsies and had them work, right? You had the, should have had them work for the benefit of the victory. And then if you wanted to, you liquidate them afterwards. That's the logical thing to do if you want to win. I ask you, what sort of professor says to his students, so here's what you should have done if you were a Nazi and you wanted to win the war. What Peterson was saying was, Hitler shouldn't have exterminated so many of the Untermenschen on arrival to the camps. He should have worked more of them to death for the benefit of the Reich. Be aware that Peterson confessed to Joe Rogan that he could have worked Jews to death at Auschwitz and enjoyed it. The next thing that happened was that uh, they decided they'd clean up the mental asylums, right? Because, well, you know, do you really want those sort of defective people being parasites on everyone else, and should they really be allowed to reproduce, and maybe it'd be just better to, you know, euthanize them because they're useless and they're suffering anyways, and so that seemed to go pretty well. And then... Peterson is talking about Germany's T4 euthanasia program, which really did happen, and which resulted in the deaths of perhaps 200,000 German citizens who were considered old or infirm. The Nazis branded such people useless eaters and burdensome lives, and continued murdering them in secret until Germany surrendered in 1945. And according to Peterson, this campaign seemed to go pretty well. What went well? A murder campaign targeting innocence. What is logical? The liquidation of innocence. Well, then you know what happened next, you know. Then the, ex the extension, the next extension was, well, to anything that was foreign, like a foreign body. And, and this showed up in all sorts of weird ways. So, um, Nazism also grew to some degree out of like nature worship. I don't know how else to describe it. There were kind of nature cults in Germany in the 1930s, and they went way back. The nature cults, he says he doesn't know how quite to describe, were bound up with vokish esotericism, a quagmire of racist and supernatural beliefs that featured white supremacy, Norse mythology, Egyptology, mysticism, alchemy, bits and bobs from world religions something called border science, which was quack science, eugenics, cultism, and Luciferianism. Peterson probably avoided mentioning Vokish esotericism, the philosophical foundation of Nazism, because essentially, it's what he teaches. Take, for instance, occultism. He's written and spoken about what he learned from the occult at least 13 times. When Peterson's third book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life, was published in 2021, Journalists and book reviewers noted that it was heavy with mythology, ignoring that Peterson made explicit references to the occult, including three images of Satan, along with a picture of a tarot card commissioned by a Satanist, and said that the book was chiefly about the Holocaust. Forget that the word Holocaust does not appear in the book. Peterson's so-called mythology is derived from the occult and vokish esotericism. I document this claim in detail in my book, The Devil and His Due, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler.
Now let's return to Peterson discussing the connection between quote-unquote nature cults and national socialism. One of the things the nature cults were concerned about in Germany was the presence of invasive species in the German, uh, you know, in, in the German ecological system. You know, and we, we complain about that now too because, you know, you get plants coming over from China and places like that that, that you know, spread through ecosystems and hypothetically disrupt them. But, you know, and that seems like a reasonable thing to be concerned about, but, and, but the reason I'm pointing out the connection is because you never know where these systems of ideas are going to lead, right? It's like, oh, contamination. Okay, fair enough, you know, contamination's real. Well, who's responsible for the contamination? Aha! That's where things start to get tricky. You know, when the Nazis just kept pushing the, pushing the limit. And so, I'll show you some of the things that come from Hitler's speeches or writings. This is from Mein Kampf. You might be interested to know that Peterson's second book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, contains fawning passages about Satan from Milton's Paradise Lost, an occultic poem by Yeats called The Second Coming about the return of the Antichrist, and an extended quote about lying from Mein Kampf. Peterson claims that 12 Rules is a self-help book that is also mainly about the Holocaust. If that were so, why would it barely touch on the Holocaust, and why would the word Holocaust appear just four times? Also, how could a self-help book be about the Holocaust, and why would a self-help book include a lengthy excerpt from the writings of Adolf Hitler? Peterson's lights are on, but nobody's home. But then, in this case, you could say the same of the media. Remember when I said that Hitler often spoke like an occultist or necromancer? You should get a sense of that when listening to Peterson reading Hitler's bizarre quotes about Jews and disease. Since the state did not possess the power to master the disease, the menacing decay of the right was manifest. That's all discussed sensitivity and contamination. The masses feel that the mere fact of the Jews' existence is as bad as the plague. Politicians tinkering around on the German national body saw at most the forms of our general disease, but blindly ignored the virus. At the time of the unification, the inner decay was already in full swing, and the general situation was deteriorating from year to year. So it's all you know, decay and, and disgust and contamination metaphor. The symptoms of decay of the pre-war period can be reduced to racial causes. The nation did not grow inwardly healthier, but obviously languished more and more. Anyone who wants to cure this era which is inwardly sick and rotten, must first of all summon up the courage to make clear the causes of the disease. Um, they think that they must demonstrate that they are ready for appeasement so as to stay the deadly cancerous ulcer through a policy of moderation. The Jew must take care that the plague does not die. If this battle should not come, Germany would decay and at best would sink to ruin like a rotting corpse. You can see in the right today an example of mortal decay. If you read about the occult, which I wouldn't recommend, but which I had to do to track down where Peterson had gotten his esoteric inspiration from, it sometimes sounds like the macabre quotes you heard from Hitler about poison, decay, the plague, death, rotting corpses, and so on. This is what Peterson is into. The first of May can only be the liberation of the nation's spirit from the infection of internationalism the restoration to health of peoples. Against the infection of materialism, against the Jewish pestilence, we must hold aloft a flaming ideal. Now that's interesting, because Hitler really liked the use of fire. Fire was a really primary element. Fire and light were real primary elements in the Nuremberg rallies. And, you know, fire has this purification element, right? That's partly why they used to burn heretics at the stake. It was like that's how you, you purify things with fire. And of course, you do purify things with fire, right? Part of the reason that we cook things is because if you cook them, then the pathogens die, and then that's purification. So it's not illogical. What he just said was, burning Jews was logical. It was logical for the Nazis to squeeze all the work they could get out of the Jews before killing them. It was logical to gas them in the crematoria and burn their corpses in ovens. In 12 Rules, Peterson writes that Lucifer represents the spirit of reason. You see, what's logical or reasonable to Jordan Peterson is that which is satanic. During this lecture, Peterson has modeled the Zig Heil and the Goose Step, and he has imitated a member of the Nazi shovel brigade holding a shovel, as well as a Nazi soldier holding a torch while saying Hitler really liked the use of fire. He then said that fire was a primary element 
a notion that comes from alchemy, which Hitler spoke of and possibly learned about from Völkisch esotericism. Alchemy also plays a key role in the occult, partly because it's connected to astrology. In Maps of Meaning, which, remember, is supposedly about the Holocaust, the words alchemy, alchemical, and alchemist appear a whopping 241 times. The word Holocaust appears just six times, and the word occult, five times. No journalist has commented on Peterson's interest in the occult. The world's most renowned public intellectual said that fire was a primary element and had a purification element. This is noteworthy because another theme in the occult is the role of fire in purification rituals. Now, here's Peterson on what he learned from the occult. I read, and I don't remember where, you know, the crucifix has Latin letters on the top of it. and It's I-N-R-I. It means it's, it's the representation of Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. Hypothetically, that was put on his cross. Um, there's an occult interpretation of that, which is also Latin, which I can't remember, but it means all nature is renewed by fire. And so the, the crucifixion then is assimilated to the idea of a forest fire. Everything burns down before there's new growth. Observe how Peterson associates the murder of Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, with fire, like how he associates the Jews' liquidation during the Holocaust with Hitler really liking the use of fire. In both cases, fire was used to purify. Just a coincidence, some might say, but no, it isn't. The occultist who wrote about INRI, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and fire was Aleister Crowley, a Satanist and anti-Semite who told his followers that he had influenced Hitler's Mein Kampf. I gave orders to burn out, burn out down to the raw flesh the ulcers of this poisoning of the wells. Really unbelievably harsh, harsh language. The only permanent way to di cure diseased conditions is to disclose their causes. Um, let's see. This is the battle against a veritable world sickness which threatens to infect the peoples, a plague which devastates whole peoples, an international pestilence. The international carrier of the bacillus must be fought. If within this community one state is infected, that infection is decisive for all alike. And then, so and he, doesn't know, he also doesn't just address this sort of language towards the sorts of people that he ended up er eradicating or trying to eradicate in the camps. He also used that in, with regards to communists. So we have a very real interest in seeing to it that this Bolshevist plague shall not spread over Europe. National socialism has made our people, and therefore the right, immune from a Bolshevik infection, um, etc. You, you get the point. Um, and here's some more language from th this metaphor. This is from a book, and I'll tell you the book in a minute. This is the, the man who wrote this book analyzed Hitler's writings and his speeches, looking for metaphorical foundations. And as I document in my book, Peterson mimics Hitler's metaphors. Sorry, correction plagiarizes Hitler's metaphors. To many, this claim seems impossible, but once you accept that Peterson is a lunatic who raves about Nazism, takes instruction from the occult, and says murdering Jews is logical, you should be open to the idea that almost anything is possible. More importantly, the evidence demonstrates that it's entirely possible. The spider was slowly beginning to suck the blood out of the people's pores, um, here we face will of the wisp eating like poisonous abscesses into the nation. It's all this, like you can hardly read these things without being disgusted by them, you know. It's all language that's associated with disgust and not with fear. And so that seemed to be very, very appealing to the Germans of the time. Horrible language. I'm going to show you a bit of a film now. It kind of shows you how this, how this <coughs> idea, how these ideas were portrayed in, in like, what we call it, uh, <coughs> propaganda, and effective propaganda means, by effective propaganda means. What are the students supposed to be learning? Who knows, because none of Peterson's lectures come with learning objectives. Furthermore, he jumps from one teacher-centered activity to the next with no transition or student participation. 
Actually, what learners are supposed to take away from the film, Fest of Nuremberg, is that the Nazis were cool. He knows that many students will be repulsed by Hitler's parasite metaphors and unmoved by Goebbels' propaganda film, but he wagers that a few might find them appealing. Also, the primary audience is people watching the lecture on YouTube, that is, Peterson's demented and illiterate followers. When Peterson praises Hitler by saying he was big on willpower, or that he should have ground down the Jews through labor before sending them to their deaths, Peterson fans understand the logic. Nazism was a religion, or a cult, they're often indistinguishable, and Hitler, like Peterson, was fond of biblical allusions. This is why he said that in the early days of National Socialism, the only people who decorated their windows with Nazi banners were the movement's bravest disciples. In Mein Kampf, he says that disciples, or apostles, should convert people to the cause by drilling Nazi tenets into their heads. And I believe this is why Peterson rapidly reads quotes from Hitler likening the Jews to vermin and germs. Indeed, Hitler gives advice on how to spread Nazism through public speaking, and Peterson has given similar advice. Compare the following. Hitler. An orator receives continuous guidance from the people before whom he speaks. This helps him to correct the direction of his speech, for he can always gauge, by the faces of his hearers, how far they follow and understand him, and whether his words are producing the desired effect. Peterson. A good speaker does a variety of things. One is that he never talks to the crowd per se. You know, you pick out specific individuals and talk to them, and they're sort of reflective of the crowd, and then you can tell if everyone's understanding. And another thing a good speaker does is pay attention to the damned responses of the crowd. You want to stay in touch with the nonverbal communications. Now, Hitler, he's kind of a chaotic guy, you know? He's very angry. Peterson said this while discussing Hitler during a lecture about Nazi Germany. But let's return to festive Nuremberg. So war es eins. Und welch ein Wunder hat sich seitdem verzogen. Sort of 
well, so you get the picture. I mean, you could hardly get a more compelling representation of perfect order than that. You know, how many thousands of people do you think there are there? All, you know, nicely arrayed into perfect squares, all moving in exactly the same way. It's like war against pestilence. It's a very strange way of looking at the Second World War, but the evidence is increasingly strong that that's the right way to look at it. All right, so we'll see you guys on Tuesday. For the fourth time, Peterson called the Nazis perfect, and when the lesson ended, his students clapped. And to think that the U of T is considered Canada's best university. That said, it's one thing for undergraduate students to be fooled, quite another for adults. What's their excuse? Jordan Peterson has become an industry. He's published by Penguin and Routledge. He gets invited to speak at Oxford and Cambridge. He's currently on his Beyond Order tour in the United States. He's taught at the University of Toronto and Harvard. He's been interviewed by nearly every major news outlet in the Western world. And he's a mentally ill Nazi who cites the occult. He does interviews with Stephen Fry, Sam Harris, and Stephen Pinker, other public intellectuals who would have us believe that we should hold them in high regard. Yet they either don't know that Peterson rants and raves about the splendors of Nazism, like a kid in a candy shop, or they do know, and they think it's fine. Noam Chomsky has likened Peterson to Hitler, but I doubt the media pays much attention to Noam Chomsky. If the powers that be cannot even recognize a Nazi, even when that Nazi is the world's most popular public intellectual, and if the widespread view that there are no Nazis persists, what does that say about us as a species? Are we really that naive and stupid? I sometimes wonder. Please hit like and subscribe, and feel free to share.